Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about the mean free path of a gas and we're also going to talk about diffusion and effusion of gases. So imagine that you are in your apartment with your roommate and you're standing at a distance of about three meters away from your roommate, at which time your roommate decides to blast a silent but deadly fart. So again, the fart is silent, so you're not aware that he has farted until you smell it. But the thing is, is, and the thing that's quite peculiar about it, is that uh, it actually takes a couple of seconds from the time your roommate farts from, uh, to the time that you actually smell it. And the question on my mind is, why does it take a few seconds? Why don't you smell it instantly? I mean, in my last video, we talked about root mean square velocity, which you can think of root mean square velocity as basically just an average speed of gas particles. And we found that the average speeds of gas particles are measured in hundreds of meters per second at atmospheric pressure. So they're really, really traveling fast. So if those gas particles are traveling at hundreds of meters per second, then why on earth does it take you a little while uh, from the time your roommate farts to the time you smell it? Hmm, that's really weird. Well, the answer is uh, that the gas particles are actually going to travel in very haphazard paths. So a gas particle isn't going to travel very far before it collides with another gas particle, completely changes its direction, uh, and then travels another short distance only to collide with another gas particle and repeat the process all over again. And so that's where the term mean free path comes from. The mean free path of a gas is the average distance that a gas particle travels from one collision to the next. And so uh, one thing, uh, one true fact about mean free path of a gas is that mean free path is going to increase with decreasing pressure. So if you had a vacuum pump uh, and you were able to kind of suck the air out of a, of a balloon or a flask or just any vessel with a gas in it, and you were to decrease the pressure of that gas, well then, on average, your gas particles are going to start to travel much longer distances uh, in between collisions. So again, you decrease the pressure, mean free path is going to increase. And just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective about mean free path, uh, consider a sample of nitrogen gas at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Well, in order to understand mean free path, we have to understand both the size of the nitrogen molecules and how long they're going to travel before the next collision. In other words, what their mean free path is. Well, the diameter, the molecular diameter of a nitrogen molecule, remember nitrogen is N2, not just one nitrogen atom, it's a diatomic molecule, it's about 300 picometers. And remember, the prefix pico means 10 to the minus 12. So 300 picometers is a very, very small length. And the mean free path of nitrogen gas at room temperature and atmospheric pressure is going to be 93 nanometers. And remember, nano means 10 to the negative 9. So 93 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, which is also very, very small. So again, even though that those nitrogen molecules are very, very small and they're traveling very, very fast, again, they're not going to travel very far before they slam into another particle. Okay? So 300 pic picometers, 93 nanometers, it might be kind of hard to grasp um, in relative terms how uh, close or far apart these two distances are. But just to put things into perspective, imagine that a nitrogen molecule was about the size of a golf ball. If the nitrogen molecule was the size of a golf ball, then on average that golf ball is going to travel about four feet before it slams into another golf ball or another nitrogen molecule, if you will. So that's mean free path for you. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the phenomenon known as diffusion of gases. So imagine this scenario here where we have two flasks, one of which has a gas inside, and those two flasks are closed off from one another by a stopcock. Well, the question on my mind that, I, that I'm going to ask you is, uh, what if we were to open up that stopcock, uh, allowing the gas to travel into the other flask? Uh, do you think all of the gas is going to travel into the other flask? Do you think all of the gas is going to stay where it is? Or do you think some of the gas is going to escape into the other flask and some of the gas is going to remain in the other flask? Well, if you chose that third answer, uh, you're correct. So once that stopcock is open and you allow the system to sort of rest for a little while, you're essentially going to get the same number of gas particles in both flasks. So on the uh, on the image on the left, we have 
all there's 12 of them, all 12 gas particles in the flask on the left, and then in the image on the right, we have six gas particles in each flask. So this phenomenon is called diffusion. And the definition, excuse me, diffusion. And the definition of diffusion is the process by which gas particles spread out in response to a concentration gradient. So what that means is that gas particles are going to travel from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And we're not going to talk about why gas particles diffuse. That's going to be uh, the topic of, uh, of another video where we talk about thermodynamics in a little bit more detail. Uh, here we're just basically acknowledging that it takes place. Uh, the diffusion of a gas is going to be influenced by uh, how fast those gas particles are traveling. So it's going to be influenced by that root mean square of velocity, which by the way, if you're kind of like confused and frustrated about what the heck is this root mean square velocity stuff, just check out my last video. It's the third part of my kinetic molecular theory video series. Uh, and I talk in much, much more detail about it. But again, if you haven't seen that video, just think of it as like an average speed of gas particles, okay? And it's also true that lighter particles are going to diffuse faster than heavier ones. So in those few seconds after your roommate just ripped a big one, uh, the particles that reach your nose first are going to be the lighter ones, and then the heavier ones are eventually going to catch up uh, shortly thereafter. So that's diffusion, again spreading out in response to a concentration gradient, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We have one last thing we got to talk about, and that is effusion of gases. So imagine we have sort of a similar system where we have uh, two flasks that are connected to one another, and there's a barrier between them, but within that barrier there's a very small hole uh, into which gas particles uh, from one vessel can escape into the other. This is the process of effusion. So effusion is the process by which gas particles escape from a container into a vacuum through a very, very small hole. Oftentimes you'll hear it referred to as a pinhole because it's so small. So it's effusion through a pinhole. And just like diffusion, effusion is also related to root mean square velocity. And just like diffusion, lighter particles are going to effuse through a pinhole faster than heavier ones. So if you're ever uh, faced with a question that, that lists off a bunch of gases and it says which one of these gases has the highest rate of effusion through a pinhole, well it's going to be the lightest one because again lighter particles effuse faster than heavier ones. Okay, And the exact relationship um, between the rate of effusion and um, how heavy the gas is, is as follows. The rate of effusion is going to be inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass of the gas. So that means it's going to be directly proportional to the reciprocal of the square root of the molar mass. So that capital italicized M, that stands for the molar mass of a gas. Now suppose we were comparing the rates of effusion for two different gases. If we were to compare the rate of effusion of one gas to the rate of effusion of another gas, then we could use uh, what's called Graham's Law of Effusion. And Graham's Law, uh, the equation corresponding to Graham's Law, looks kind of like this, where let's say we have two gases, we'll call them A and B, and they are related to one another by this equation, where we have the rate of gas A, or the rate of effusion for gas A, divided by the rate of effusion for gas B, it's going to be equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas B divided by the molar mass of gas A. So it's kind of interesting where we have A over B on the left-hand side of that equation, but then we have B over A on the right-hand side of that equation. Okay, so as we wrap up this video, let's just do uh, one example where we apply Graham's law of effusion. So this problem says that we have an unknown gas and it effuses at a rate that is 4.00 times that of oxygen gas. And we're assuming that both of these gases are effusing at the same temperature. And it says to calculate the molar mass of the unknown gas. Again, we're going to use that Graham's Law equation where we have rate A over rate B equals square root of molar mass of B over molar mass 
of A. And we're going to go ahead and assume that gas A is the oxygen and that gas B is our unknown. Again, you could do it either way. It doesn't matter. You're, you'll still arrive at the same result. But in this one, we're just going to assume that gas A is the oxygen uh, for which we actually know the molar mass. We can easily look it up on the periodic table. And then gas B, that's our unknown. That's the molar mass that we're trying to figure out. So it follows that the rate of effusion for the oxygen over the rate of effusion for the unknown is going to be equal to the square root of the molar mass of the unknown divided by the molar mass of O2. So if we square both sides of this equation, then we'll get this result down here where we have the rate of effusion for oxygen divided by the rate of effusion for the unknown. That whole quantity squared is going to be equal to the molar mass of the unknown divided by the molar mass of the oxygen gas. And then after that, all we have to do is just multiply both sides of this new equation by the molar mass of oxygen, and that will isolate the molar mass of the unknown all on one side of the equation by itself. And so if we do that, we will get our final result, which is the molar mass of the unknown is equal to the molar mass of oxygen multiplied by the square of the uh, rate of effusion for the oxygen divided by the rate of effusion for your unknown. Uh, all we have to do now is just uh, plug in our numbers here. So again, the molar mass of oxygen gas, it's just uh, the molar mass of one oxygen atom times two, owing to the fact that oxygen is a diatomic molecule. So that's going to come in at 31.998 grams per mole. And then uh, the relationship between the rate of the unknown and the rate of the oxygen, well, again, uh, it's four times that the rate of the unknown is four times that of oxygen gas. So if we assume, if we assume the rate of oxygen to be one, uh, then that makes our calculations easy. We can just assume the rate of effusion for the unknown to be four. So it's going to be one fourth squared times that 31.998 grams per mole. And this turns out to be 4.00 grams per mole. So this gas, this unknown gas, is most likely helium because the molar mass that we calculated is far closer to the molar mass of helium than to any other gas uh, that is known. So that's how you use Graham's Law of Effusion. I uh, hope you found this video both educational and somewhat humorous. Um, maybe a little inappropriate, but what can I say? I like to take chances. I don't know. Uh, all right, so that's it. Peace.